Just over 50 years old as an independent nation, Malaysia has emerged as one of the fastest growing economies in Asia today. Although a young country, it is a land that has long been home to a confluence of old cultures. The Malaysia we live in today has really been formed as a result of the traditions that have come before us. Everybody uses rituals to define who they are. The state of Negeri Sembilan anchors much of its identity in the elaborate rites of its unique royal traditions. What we are looking at is this magnificent display of the richness of the culture that has been retained for many, many hundred years. Over the coming days, the official installation of Negeri Sembilan's new ruler will mark the biggest royal event this state has seen in over 40 years. This is a moment that I don't think that I will experience it again in my lifetime. Saya berbangga di kampung saya ada petabalan ni yang lama saya tunggu 41 tahun ni. Oh ada petabalan ni jadi macam satu benda history ya. For the first time, Discovery Channel goes behind the scenes of the grand celebrations and rituals laying the path to the throne for Negeri Sembilan's 11th ruler. An incredible rite of passage that reveals the special role Malaysia's monarchies play. A unique bridge between the world it must keep up with and the one it cannot leave behind. Malaysia stands out with an interesting role in the story of Asia's economic development. Its icons of progress reflect a balance it strives for between the demands of modernity and the values of its diverse social landscape. Positioned at the crossroads of the region's historical trading routes, Malaysia is a federation of 13 states. Nine are traditional royal domains and sultanates. Today, Malaysia is home to nearly a third of the world's monarchs who remain practicing heads of state. Beyond their regal realms, Malaysia's royalty have always played integral roles in developing the nation. Many have the added responsibility of protecting traditions. Tunku or Prince Ali Radaudin's work in his home state has gotten busier lately. I think I do a fairly good balancing act of uh, bridging modernity and tradition. Um, I'd spent uh, most of my uh, life, uh, particularly my adult life, in, in the world of modernity, uh, being in the corporate environment. These over the past week, both on the Stana side... Then I've always had a passion for history. As a result, I've always regarded tradition as being very important. Like Taking the traditions that form part of who I am over here and bringing them back out into the modern world, I guess, is, is something that I have to do every day. But what is about to unfold in the royal bastion of Sri Mananti in Negeri Sembilan does not happen every day. Drawing out the palace regalia marks the first milestone in a series of rituals required to officially install the state's new ruler. As Tunku Besar, or senior prince, Tunku Ali is entrusted to preside over ancient customs paving the way for his father's passage to the throne. Memanglah satu negeri yang unik. Sistem beraja yang unik. Pelantikan beraja yang unik. Tidak ada pada negeri lain. Located close to the federal capital Kuala Lumpur, Negeri Sembilan is one of Malaysia's smallest states, but retains some of its grandest royal traditions. Its royal capital, Sri Mananti, sits in a valley deep in the rural heartland. For over 200 years, this has been the seat of a royal dynasty that began with Raja Malewa, invited from Sumatra to rule the state. Its oldest tana, possibly the tallest timber palace in the world, is the ancestral home to some of Malaysia's most distinguished monarchs. This is the birthplace of the first young Dipertuan Agong, or paramount ruler of the independent federation of Malaya, Tonku Abdul Rahman. Negeri Sembilan's rulers come from a unique tradition of being elected by local chieftains. After 41 years, this royal democracy of sorts has chosen a new heir to the throne. 
one finally graduating from the role of senior prince is held for nearly half a century. Twanku Mukhris Ibni Almarhum Twanku Munawir will be officially installed as the 11th Young Dipertuan Basar, or great ruler of Nagari Sambilan. This was taken in 65 or 1966. This is at the old airport. And I just arrived from England, from school, uh, school holidays. Greeted by my family, my late father, my grandmother, and my sisters. His return to Sri Mananti over the coming days involves an event much bigger than a homecoming for Twanku Mohris. Throughout the state, final preparations are underway for his official installation or patabalan. This elaborate event ushers Tonka Mukhris in as the ultimate bearer of his state's royal traditions. In Nagari Sambilan, this is a big responsibility. One of my uh, duties is actually to uphold Malay customs and traditions. We place great value in these traditions because they represent not just physical acts, but also the underlying reasons for these traditions. Patabalan itself is the apex of all the traditions behind it. Across the traditional heartland of Nagari Sambilan, the Patabalan represents a chance for her people to revive an arsenal of ancient customs. Benda ni yang sebenar dia kalau kita war-warkan seperti bagaimana yang kita buat hari ini, jadi pendek kata di pada sinilah pendedahan tadi itu kepada peringkat generasi hari ini. All of these are traditions that have been happening here in Nagari Sambilan over the over the last few hundred years. None of this has happened in the last 40, so obviously I've never witnessed any of it. So it's all new to me. Uh, figuring it out as I go along. <laughs> The journey ahead reveals the grandest rituals Nagari Sambilan has been waiting for, literally for a lifetime. One called upon by heads of governments and states, bringing the institutions of today to honor the traditions of the past. The days are counting down to the official installation of Twanku Muhris as the 11th monarch of Nagari Sambilan. After 41 years, the time has come again for a new ruler, sworn to uphold the traditions of his people. Joining Twanku on this journey are his sons and his consort, Twanku Aisha Rohani, herself from another royal family in Malaysia. But the state Her Royal Highness is now part of has unique traditions of its own. This state, Negris Milan, they got a motto on tradition and custom. The Malay says, Biar mati anak, jangan mati adat, which means to say, your children die, but make sure that tradition don't die. You know what I mean? <laughs> For centuries, Sri Mananti has been the sanctuary of Nagari Sambilan's staunch royal traditions. It harbors ancient customs carried through a long line of rulers. Before he can be officially installed, Tuanku Mukhris must perform an important ritual that has its roots in the earliest kingdoms of the Malay archipelago. Reviving such ancient rites today requires months of preparation. Ceremonial guards work with the royal armed forces, going over every detail to relive the event authentically. <laughs> Ceremonies of this sort are rare. It's a great relieving of what is almost forgotten. Thousands of well wishers have come to witness Twanku Muhris and Twanku Aisha Rohani embark on the journey of a lifetime. Every step deeper into a realm of ancient rites kept alive through the ages. What we are looking at is this magnificent display of the richness of the culture, not so much the protocol, but the ritual. I think the ritual that has been retained for many, many hundred years. The new ruler's path to the throne arrives at a symbolic milestone. Before he can be officially installed, he must perform an important cleansing ritual. The Basiram ceremony has evolved organically over the centuries but its core values remain intact. 
Maksudnya adalah untuk mensucikan ke diri kebah duli tuan pun. Dan sesunya mendapat taufik dan hidayah pada Tuhan Rabu Jalil dan dapat melaksanakan pemerintahan yang adil dan sakit sama selama baginda menduduki takta kerajaan. Bersiram somehow uh, that began during the pre-Islamic situation is now conducted in the same manner but with different intention. Fulfilling another faith or cosmology or spirituality. The underlying epistemology of that is about cleanliness. And I believe in royal family it has a special function. A new man, a new person, you are entering now into a new role. There you are, you're ready and clean. Everybody uses rituals to define who they are. Uh, Negeri Sembilan is no different. I think they're very pertinent in terms of defining who we are as a people and what the ruler signifies to the state. Like most royal states in Malaysia, Negeri Sembilan retains a rural and agrarian landscape. It was settled in the 15th century by the Minangkabau from Sumatra, the world's largest matrilineal society. Today, their descendants are renowned for preserving a unique set of customs called Adat Pepate. In a society that celebrates the supremacy of tradition, some of the most revered positions are reserved for clansmen born with the responsibility to protect ancient customs. For the palace's most senior ceremonial officers, the installation of their ruler is an event that calls on them to take center stage. Ampun tunggu, pada itu kita makan bawa satu mutawat lah selamat disempurnakan. Saya merupakan Datuk Sri Ahmad Dirja yang ke-14 dan saya memanglah orang yang pertama sekali, yang mula-mula sekali memulakan istiadat dan susunya apabila selesai menutup istiadat. Dan jawatan ini memanglah satu jawatan yang mana dijawat oleh keturunan nasab ibu saya dan tidak boleh dipegang oleh mana-mana suku yang lain. Not all positions in the royal palace are hereditary. The ceremonial guards are led by the Dato Satya Bajaya. Though not a birthright, he carries his appointments by the previous ruler, Tuanku Jaffa, with a profound sense of destiny. Adatan yang saya sandang hari ini mula saya terima semasa kembalinya saya daripada haji. Jadi dalam masa-masa saya berada di sana, saya bermimpi. Bermimpi saya dibawa oleh satu orang ke satu tempat. Ke satu tempat yang penuh berwarna silver kuning, emas. Bila saya masuk ke dalam bilik itu, saya ternampak. Saya ternampak kebah oleh tuanku, almarhum. Sebabnya saya pun tak tahu macam mana apabila saya balik daripada menunaikan haji, saya dimaklumkan, diberitahu oleh istana mengatakan bahawa tuanku berkenan melantik saya sebagai ketua Pegasus Sembilan. Perasaan gembira tu saya tak dapat nak cakap macam mana sebab ini satu pengalaman yang saya rasa mungkin saya tak dapat lupakanlah. Most of the people have never witnessed the grand installation of their ruler. But Negeri Sembilan has retained a social architecture designed to cultivate its treasured customs from one generation to the next. No institution can survive for hundreds of years without changing with the times. I think it's always a balance. On the one hand, changing a bit with the times, but on the other hand, reminding the times that uh, you know there's this history, this tradition that, that comes before you. Tuanku Muhris's family have all taken very hands-on roles for the big event. His father's installation gives Tunku or Prince Zain al Abidin the opportunity to unveil his new arrangement of the state anthem. Okay. 
Are you going to do it again? When I was doing some research on the anthem in preparation for the installation, uh, we discovered that uh, uh, schools in the Gris Milan were singing different versions of the anthem, and even online, I found vastly different arrangements. So the point of rearranging the anthem was uh, one, to standardize the melody and the words, and secondly, to reinvigorate the anthem. Moving forward, what we're trying to encourage is more personal engagements with the, with the anthem. As the main event nears, preparations have picked up pace. Detailed renovations have gone into the Balairong or throne room, the stage where the official installation will soon unfold. This balai has evolved over the years. When the, when the Istana was first built and the balai was, was here, it was effectively just an outdoor sort of pavilion. Uh, so it was open on all the edges. Uh, you happen to have a throne at the top of here. And this is where my great-grandfather, Tonkud Rahman, um, was, uh, was installed uh, in 1934. Yeah. One of the things that we were quite keen to do was to try and link what was in here with what was important to us in the Grisby land. The old carpet, which has now been removed, included designs that were very distinctly not from the Grisby land, including uh, you know, Fleur de Lis, which is uh, European. If you now look at the chairs, you'll see that the flower motif is actually a motif taken from the Istana Lama. As his family explore more passages into the traditions of their ancestry, for Twanku Muhris, it is the Istana Lama, or Old Palace of Sri Mananti, that has always anchored him to his heritage. I actually grew up um, just next door. This was in the early to mid-1950s, when my grandfather was a ruler. Later on, when my father was the ruler, he, he loved this place, and we used to actually stay here rather than at the main Istana. I've grown to like the tradition of this place that it represents so when I got married, this was a right choice. The wedding ceremony was held just behind where I'm sitting, was the place where my great-grandfather had his throne. So I thought that was very apt. Once he officially becomes ruler, Twanku Muhris will hold the ultimate responsibility of taking the traditions of his forefathers into the future. But in Negri Sambilan, it takes more than ancestry to qualify for this position. Nineteen fifty seven. After eighty years of British colonialism, eleven states, including nine royal Malay kingdoms, joined forces to form an independent federation of Malaya, a parliamentary democracy with a constitutional monarchy. The spirit of federalism put in place a system where each of the nine rulers take five year turns as the paramount ruler among them. Negri Sambilan's own Twanku Abdul Rahman became the first king of the new federation. Some legal scholars even cite Negri Sambilan as the, the origins of federalism in Malaysia today. I do feel that Negri Sambilan is unique in its style as a federation. It existed as a federation even before the United States of America was a, was a federation. The seeds of federalism were sown in Negri Sambilan nearly a quarter of a millennium ago. In 1773, Raja Malewa, a royal from Pagaruyong in Sumatra, journeyed across the Straits of Malacca on the invitation of Negri Sambilan's chieftains to become their ruler. As part of the celebrations leading up to his father's official installation as the state's new ruler, Tunku Zain al Abidin leads an expedition retracing the route taken by his royal ancestor. We do have a claim that stretches back to 1347, which is when Aditya Warman, a local prince, was elevated to become paramount ruler of Pagaruyong. So our genealogy, as it were, I think, begins then. And that would place us amongst, perhaps, one of the older monarchies still in existence today. 
This is a bunch of stuff that we found here in the Astana. And I was poking around a cupboard. There was a lot of junk there. And uh, some of it actually proved to be pretty interesting. Mostly personal letters and correspondence between our great-grandfather, but also random things such as postcards and newspapers. We've always been interested in family history. We are history buffs. I have been researching the various bits and pieces of the family tree for years. Coming across this gold mine was, was just, uh, you know, beyond the wildest dreams of many historians, I would imagine. <laughs> so this is, in fact, the seal of our great-great-great-grandfather, uh, Tuanku Yam Tuan Anta. And um, it, we've got a picture of it in the book, and it, you know, it actually says, Yam Tuan Tuanku Anta Sri Mananti. So this was affixed to a lot of the treaties, some of which we found and some of which we haven't, the most important being the 1898 agreement between uh, the Undangs and Tonku Muhammad, for example, would have chops like these. This is a landmark agreement which, in essence, restored the old socio-political order in Negris Milan. So this puts in black and white a reaffirmation of the 1773 uh, arrangement. And in fact, in the first line, it, it, it explicitly says, we hereby restore the old order. Negri Sambilan actually means nine states, the only one in the world that calls itself by number. The old order is made up of nine traditional fiefdoms called Luaks, each with their own chieftain. They sought a royal candidate from their Minangkabau motherland to rule over them. It was happening during uh, feudal time. So for me, uh, one of the interesting things about feudalism is the fierce, powerful central ruler who controls the rest. But here we see in Negris Milan, nine small states fiercely retaining their autonomy but inviting someone uh, to become their king. Negeri yang lain, biasanya, apabila sultan atau peraja makan, anak dan berinda akan menggantikan. Tetapi di Negeri Milan, tidak. Most other monarchies of the world are predictably linear dynasties. But the old order determined a very different succession system for Negeri Sambilan. Candidates for the position of ruler are cast from a pool of royal descendants. Because historically, historically, the Yang Di Pertuan was invited from somewhere else to become Yang Di Pertuan, the Jadi Kan Tuan, the one who's made the Tuan or the King. So, the power of the selecting the heir to the throne is not in the hand of the Sultan. It's in the hand of the Undang. The Undang are the chieftains from the biggest Luaks or traditional fiefdoms of Negeri Sambilan. Since 1773, they've remained the kingmakers of the state, themselves subject to election by leaders of respective clans. Uh, bulat Buapa menjadikan lembaga, bulat lembaga menjadikan undang. I mean, agreement and consensus among the Buapa, which is the leader of the lineage, makes the lembaga, the leader of the clan. Consensus among the clan leaders makes the undang. 